we had a uh, we had a very active group. It was small, um, but it was very very much engaged. Our uh, our workshop was on near term deployment in Europe and China. Um, I think the two areas could probably be more different, and trying to put them to put them together in in one set of of uh, of issues and and next steps, et cetera, is I think a little bit dif difficult. Just as an overview, Europe, although it's trying to become the United States of U United States of Europe, it isn't there yet. Uh, we do have national governments, 28 of them, at least for the moment, uh, 27 in another year's time. Um, and we have the European Union with its European Commission. So it's, it's a very different way of dealing with issues. Uh, I think one of the things, if, if, we're, if we are going to combine it next year, my recommendation to Alan is that we spend a little bit of time on identifying what, what the differences are, because I think they're, they're significant enough for those people who are trying to deploy in Europe, it's, it's worth having an understanding of what's going on over there. Uh, and I think the, the reverse is true. So I, I try to spend some time with my friends in Europe explaining the, the difference between electing a president in the United States and electing a prime minister in, in one of the countries in Europe. But uh, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult. So China's a bit different. It's very, it's very linear. There's a national policy, there are public agencies, et cetera. So our, our key findings, and these were general, these were, these were both from the, from the Chinese group as well as from our European group. We need to build trust for using these systems because the trust right, right now isn't there. We need to accept that the, the technology is costly right now, and it's going to continue to be costly for a while, so we need to, we need to address that. In order for us to be doing short-term deployments, we need, we're going to need to get money, investments from the private sector, and, and uh, also money from the, from the public sector. Security is an issue that requires much more attention. And this was, this was specifically noted by my, our Chinese co colleagues. Unfortunately, most people had to leave in order to get planes back. But um, those who are there, if I'm saying anything wrong, Michelle, please, please correct me. But security is an issue we, that requires more attention. Um, especially when we're starting to increase connectivity. One of the issues I think we need to focus on next year is V2X, because people were talking about 5G as if it was part of V2X, it isn't. Um, and and there, there are two very big issues and very different sets of issues, or three, when you consider what's going on in China, Europe, and the United States. And I think that if we're going to have connected cars they need to be connected to each other and to the infrastructure. So we need to address that next year with a bit more uh, focus. Uh, technology isn't there, although we had a couple of really good presentations about personal rapid transit, different types of implementations. I wish you all could have seen them. And hopefully the, the presentations will be distributed to everyone. So these were, these were, this is stuff that's actually happening now. It's not, this isn't, this isn't going on, you know, this is, this is very near-term deployment because the stuff is deployed. Um, key findings specifically for China, bus companies don't want to pay. So in order to get these systems in the buses, there's going to have to be money that's going to be put on the table primarily by the government. Uh, the local governments, just like in Greenville, the local governments are very, very active by promoting finding ways of getting investments, and, and so the local governments are, are very much part of the solution here, even, even more so than the, than the, federal, the, the uh, central government. And of course, confidentiality of personal data is not an issue, and that's completely different from the situation that we have in, uh, in Europe. The key findings in Europe, um, the European Commission is being pressured by the service companies, service companies providing content, providing, let's say, roadside assistance, for example, um, to be able to obtain the data from any vehicle so that the data that's coming off any vehicle, whether it's a bus or a car or whatever it is, a truck, that that data is made accessible to, to multiple service providers. Today, that's not the case, and it's not, it's not even easy. It's not even possible today. Uh, so they're asking for that, and that's going to make some ex ex major differences in how these implementations can occur. And, of course, the vehicle companies are pressuring the, the European Commission for exactly the opposite. They've invested lots of money, they want to keep this data. So this issue is playing and playing out, and of course, once the European Commission decides on something, it's just gonna, it's, 
It may take years, but it will, it, it will get its way. Uh, the general data protection regulation uh, is something that's having a major effect. If you don't know what it is, you need to find out if you're going to be doing any business at all in, with European com uh, companies or trying to work within the European framework. Um, who will own the passenger's data, particularly within the context of GD GDPR? The passenger, it doesn't own the vehicle, but the, the passenger's data is covered by G GDPR and how this is going to be implemented in car sharing, in ride sharing, um, in leased vehicles that are leased out, subleased to others, it's, it's a very important issue. Um, and um, Adriano made this case in, in both, the, the, both the session this morning and our session this afternoon. We have to establish the business case. And even if we don't have profitability under the current, uh, current deployments, even short-term or, or medium-term deployments, we at least have to know where we're going with this. Uh, public transport, public transit, riding on the, on the buses is too, ex it's, it's too inexpensive. I know this. I, I spend a lot of time on public transport these uh, these days. Ever since I began working closer to home than traveling to tra to China and North America, it really is too expensive. That's inexpensive. We can go pretty much anywhere we need to. So, in order to be able to have a business case, we're going to have to do something about that. Uh, the legal framework, as far as needs are concerned, we need to be much clearer about the legal framework. It's okay in China that things are fuzzy because everything works within this fuzzy atmosphere. You don't really know if it's a law because the law may not actually be defined. Uh, but you know what the regulations are because whoever is providing you with the service, they've got a piece of paper on the wall that says they're authorized to do that. And you only get that if you're a Chinese company. Uh, I was working as a consultant to a Chinese company. They had a wall that was big as, as big as this with, with eight, a4 size papers on it saying that they, are, they were certified to do everything they could possibly want, want them to do. That's not the case in, um, in Europe, but we need to define what that legal framework is. And the problem we have in Europe is this, this takes consensus with European eCall. If you're not familiar with the European eCall, it took us from 2002 until 2018 to get a little box in the car that, that called the equivalent of 911 or 112. Um, and the reason is that we needed to get all 28 countries on board in order to get that implemented. And I think this is the main takeaway. We need to, uh, we can't wait until everything is perfect. We need, you know, we're not going to be able to do everything we need to do in order to have a vehicle without a driver or without stewards. We need to be able to get out there with something as quickly as we can meeting all of the certification, meeting all the regulations, making sure that we're not going around anything, <clears throat> and then try to get ex gain experience, get feedback, in order to go back into the regulatory process and inform the commissioners, inform the parliamentarians, inform the governments and, and the, pros the groups uh, of uh, gov the national governments in order to get this into the regulatory process. Actionable steps, next step, what we saw was Determine what the level of performance that we need is, is good enough. Somebody said the Goldilocks. That was, I love that, that comparison. What's good enough right now that we can address a potential solution you know, to a particular problem? The one problem that came out from, our, from Fred from, from Greenville, we need to increase mobility for a group of people without building more roads. And we, have, we need to be able to make statements like that. What are we trying to achieve? What is the objective of, of doing something? You make that, and then you work, you work toward the solution. So uh, define what that is. What's the potential cost of operation with a mobility solution? What, what, if, what can we charge? What's the potential for, for making this business case? What are the regulatory and certification issues that we have to address for this particular problem? And then how does this autonomous automated vehicle solution compare to the human solution. So you can make it, you can, you can show and you can explain in very clear terms, this is what we can do today, this is the problem we're trying to address, this is what we have as a solution, and this is how we think we can move forward. And hopefully do that, something of this form, within the next year so that we can report on it when we're all back here on May 14th. 2019.